awfully sorry. Really, I am. But what is it this time? The brig has bronchitis, and I can't leave him. The doctor says it would easily turn into pneumonia if he doesn't stay in bed and do exactly what he's told. And I'm afraid I'm the only person who can make him. Sit, darling. You still there? But it's only three days, Rachel. Surely there are enough people there who can manage for three days. You couldn't be more disappointed than I am. Sid had wanted to rage and shout. Oh yes, I could. I can. You don't know how disappointed I am. You simply do not know. But we've booked the rooms and everything. Well, I must pay for that, of course. Don't bother, darling. I can hear you're angry, and I am so sorry. It just can't be helped. When she had put the earpiece back, she found that she was crying. It seemed like the worst disappointment of her life. She would never be first with Rachel. She would never be able to have her to herself. Even these pathetic, rationed little oases that she trudged towards for weeks could be turned by Rachel into mirages. Maidavale, darling, I've been talking to the duchy. She says, why don't you come down here for three days? This offer seemed to illuminate, as nothing else had ever done, the hopeless gap between them. No, I think I'll go anyway. I really need the fresh air and exercise. Do thank the duchy for her kind offer. I might take Thelma with me. Oh, that's a good idea. It would be nicer for you to have company. I hope you have a lovely, restful time, darling. Do ring as soon as you're back. <laughs> Nanny won't be a minute. <laughs> Sebastian, shush! If you don't stop, then then I'll start, and that would never do, would it? <laughs> Your grandmother would think even more badly of me than she does already. The core of the trouble was that while everybody at Hatton, especially Z, all adored baby Sebastian, Louise, his mother, who was supposed to be the most besotted, was nothing of the kind. Do you think it might be time for lunch, Thelma? If you like. Not here, though. Good. Why not? This bench looks jolly convenient, not to mention comfortable. But it's on a footpath. Let's go over to those rocks over there. <laughs> Are you worried that some passing hiker will try to catch a sandwich? No. Well, what then? I thought we could stretch out a bit more over there. That's all. <laughs> Race you. Ah, there you are, Louise. Michael telephoned earlier. Why didn't you tell me? You were in the nursery, and I didn't want to drag you away. Don't worry. I told him you were fine, and that Sebastian is putting on weight since the new nanny arrived. But. Z, I would have liked to speak to him. No, we didn't have long. Next time, he wanted to say that he'd been awarded the DSC. It's the Distinguished the Service Cross. Cross. Yes, I know. Well, you could look a bit more pleased about it. This is quite common, you know, Louise. What is? What you're experiencing. Is it? Yes. A great many women feel low just after they've had a baby. But it's been going on for far too long now. You really must pull yourself together and get over it. It's so terribly unattractive. I don't want to feel like this. I'm giving one of my lunches today. I think that might help take you out of yourself. This turned out to be what Louise called one of Z's distinguished old codgers luncheons: an admiral, an ambassador retired, a general. And a very doddery old thing. Z placed her next to. That's right. You come and sit next to me. I, I need cheering up a bit. Please don't get up. I'm fine. Yeah, I can see that. You can never just lie down like this and look at the sky in London. I suppose you could in Hyde Park. Not without our being overlooked. No. See it. Yes. Can I say something? Can I stop you? I adore you, Thelma. I'm so happy. Just to be alone with you is perfect. I shush. Just perfect. It was easy in the beginning for Sid to confuse desire with love. 
she felt glad that all her bitterness about Rachel had somehow melted. It seemed miraculous to be wanted so much by someone so young, whose innocence was only matched by her passion. I used to be an explorer. No, not anymore. Nowadays, I'm hard put to find my way to the bedroom at night. Uh, and what do you do in the daytime? Louise had learned that one was supposed to pursue the conversation and not simply acquiesce in what had been said to one. Good question. Explore the cavities in my own teeth. <laughs> Those that left me. I haven't quite reached the sands, everything, but oh, well, no doubt I shall. <laughs> My word, you are pretty, aren't you? Huh? Something about the way he looked at her made her feel hot, and she didn't reply. If everyone would like to move into the drawing room for coffee, <clears throat> Louise has to go and feed her enchanting baby. Oh, Louise, why did you bring Sebastian to the drawing room and feed him there? Uh -huh. I'm sure everyone will be delighted to meet him and see you both. Uh, uh, jolly good idea, huh? No. Actually, I don't think I will. Uh -huh. uh, don't, don't go. Uh -huh. Our last day. Good morning, really. We have to get the train this afternoon. Oh, Sid. Let's go on our walk. Well, we can have a walk. I mean the one we but... did on the first morning. Oh, there won't be time, Thelma. It took us nearly three hours to get there. Don't you want to go? <laughs> it's not a question of whether I want to or not. So you do? We've no chance of getting back to catch the 2.30. So you don't want to? Well, only because... Why do you want to go back there so particularly? Because that's where I found out that you loved me. I... Where you said you loved me. Sid opened her mouth to say she had never said she loved her. And didn't, but couldn't. It was true, but it would be bitterly unkind to say so. That was the first jolt of reality. Thelma, I'm truly sorry, but there isn't time to go back there. Good morning, Louise. Good morning. There's a letter for you from Michael. It's been opened. Oh, yes, I opened it in error. I'm so used to his writing, you see. But you read it all the same. I can see it's upset you. Please don't make a fuss in front of Michael's father. He'll be sorry if you're upset, and that will upset him, which, as you know, is not good for his heart. Louise did not for one second believe it had been opened in error. And yet Z had excused herself to the point where she did not even seem to think an apology was necessary. Louise came uneasily to the conclusion that Hatton was Z's world and she made all the rules in it. Maybe next time we could go to Stratford. Uh, Stratford? Yes, I've never been there. Or anywhere, I don't mind. Thelma, I'm sorry, but I don't think this can happen again. Why not? I do like you, but I don't feel the same way about you that you feel about me and... I don't think I can live with that inequality. Is there someone else? No. It's not to do with anyone else. Not your friend Rachel Cazalet, for instance. What, why do you say that? <laughs> I wonder. Oh, Thelma, please understand. She doesn't care for you in the way I do. I feel you and I are all we've got. That's no reason... I know you don't feel the same way about me as I do about you, and I don't mind. I do. It's, it's not fair to you. <laughs> I think you must love me more than you realise to care so much about my feelings. I'll do exactly whatever you want. There's no need for anything to change. I can come and see you and, and help you with cooking and, and cleaning and have lessons and play sonatas with you. Oh, please, where's the harm? Sid could not help putting herself in Thelma's place. She understood what it felt like to be single-mindedly in love. She knew, better than most, the agonizing frustration of it being unrequited. On top of that, she knew in some awful way her vanity was engaged. It was consolation and a reassurance to be so cared for and wanted. All right. Let's have a look in our diaries when we get back. Thank 
you for agreeing to come for a walk with me. I expect this fresh air will do me good. This time tomorrow I'll be back in London. I don't like the idea of you and Sebastian being all alone in that house. Oh, we won't be. Nanny will be there, and my cousins Clary and Polly are coming to stay. And, of course, Michael, when he's on leave. Have you thought it through, Michael winning the DSC? Thought it through? Yes. It means you'll have to go to Gives to buy the appropriate ribbon to sew onto his uniform. Oh, yes, of course. I shall come to London to go to the palace with him. Oh. Oh, my dear, you will come with us. He's allowed two tickets worth of audience. I was saying to him the other day that I really thought I should present you, but we decided that it would be better to wait until you've had the next baby. What? Let's sit down, Louise. I have walked enough. Here. This fallen tree's been here so long it's almost seat-shaped. Ah. You are not an awfully good mother, are you? What? I know when Michael was born, I was unable to think of anything but him for months and months, but Nanny tells me you are hardly ever in the nursery. It is therefore very important that Sebastian should have a brother to play with. Surely you can see that. I... I haven't discussed this with Michael. Oh, Michael is deeply in favour of a large family. It's the reason why he married you. Surely you knew that. No... I told him you were too young. But he was sure you were the right wife for him, and of course I would want anything he wanted to make him happy. I expect you want that too. But if... If I felt that you were unhappy in any way, making him unhappy, I should stab you to death. I should enjoy doing it. They walked back to the house, and already the scene in the wood seemed unreal. So bizarre that Louise half thought that perhaps it had not happened at all. But it served to make her all the more determined to get back to London as soon as possible. The Duchy has insisted that whatever happens, I'm not to miss out on another holiday. That's kind of her, but unfortunately, illness can't be predicted. I know. She says, though, that if it happens again, they'll pay for a nurse. So I can definitely come away with you next time. The thing is, Rachel, I'm afraid I've already agreed to spend some of half-term with Thelma. Darling, if what you're trying to say is that you want Thelma to come too, I quite understand. No, no, I didn't mean that. I only meant that the timing is slightly awkward, because I promised to take her to Stratford for a few days, and she'd arranged her leave to coincide with mine. Maybe I could tag along. It's just a pity you didn't tell me sooner. I'm sure, I'm sure Thelma can make another plan about leave. I'll talk to her. Yes, but do bear in mind that I would perfectly understand if she can't. And then we could all three go, which might be the simplest thing in the end. Oh, no, it wouldn't, Sid thought, when she had put the earpiece back. It certainly would not. I wish you didn't have to go. I wish I could stay, but I have to get back for Jules. I'd really like to meet her. Why don't you bring her with you one weekend? She's too old, Jack. She would talk about you. I couldn't stop her. Would that be so terrible? I think it would be difficult. I can't tell them about you. They would be shocked. They wouldn't like the idea of you being in love with a Jew. It isn't that. Can you honestly tell me that if I was some British lord or earl or whatever you have here, you wouldn't have taken me home to meet your family by now? There's nothing to do with that. It's because I'm married to Rupert. I thought you loved me. I do. It's because I love you. They'd know at once, and... And can't you see? They'd feel I was betraying him. They would feel I ought to wait in case Rupert does come back. I see. And if he does, that's the end of us, is it? You're trying to keep your options open. You aren't trying to understand me. I'm afraid to. I bet you'd married that friend of his, Archie, who you talk so much about. <sighs> I only talk about him because he's Rupert's friend. And I told you. He was very understanding about... Us. Your precious family would probably approve of you and him being together. He goes to stay, doesn't he? When I told you about Rupert that first evening, you seemed to understand exactly what it was like. The situation I was in. 
What has changed? We've fallen in love, I thought. Really in love. That means not just now, today. It concerns the whole of our lives. You're not a child, Zoe. You're a grown woman. You can make your own choices. Oh, or isn't any of this true for you? I, I, I really need to know. I do love you. You must know that perfectly well. I suppose I've been living on a kind of island with you. I haven't thought about anyone else. I shall now. Zoe. Zoe, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean, I'm just, I'm sorry. I really didn't want to have a row, please forgive me. I'm glad we did, sort of. It's made me understand just how much I love you, but also how little I know you. Then please promise me you'll come up next weekend. I will. And I'll introduce you to Archie, so you won't need to feel jealous of him. At least that's one thing I can put your mind at rest about. Excuse me, does Michael Hadley live here? Well, when he's on leave, he does. Um, when's he coming on leave? I'm not quite sure. Oh, oh well. I'll wait. Um, you must be Louise Hadley. I saw a picture of you getting married in the Times. <laughs> I was overseas, or I'd have been there like a shot... It's rather an overworked analogy these days, isn't it? <laughs> I say, you haven't got anything to eat. I had a sort of poison pie on the train. I thought I could fancy it, but could I keep it down? I I'm a kind of cousin, by the way. My name's Hugo Wentworth. Oh, uh, I'm delighted to meet you, Hugo. If you come down to the kitchen, I'll make you some toast with Bovril. You won't mind me staying for a bit, will you? Oh, well, uh, it's not just Michael and I who live here. My cousins Polly and Clary do, too. Oh, do you have to look after them? <laughs> no. They're only two years younger than I am. They were going to live with Polly's dad, but... That would be your uncle? Yes, but they managed to persuade him to let them stay with me, and Michael, instead. So you see, the, the house is rather full. <laughs> oh, I can dust them on the floor. I'm lamentably used to discomfort. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Hello, Edward. It's Zoe. Zoe? Has something happened at the home place? No. Uh, it's just that someone called Isla has just rung and wanted to speak to you. Must have been a wrong number. She said it was about her sister-in-law, Diana, who lives in Wadhurst. Oh. What about her? She's all right, apparently. But there's been a fire at her cottage that she, Isla, thought you should know about. Does Billy know about this? No. I took the call and then I telephoned you straight away. Good. Thank you. <sighs> what a balls up. Sorry, I, I can't think what possessed that wretched woman. Uh, of course, Billy's met Diana, but years ago, and, and she probably wouldn't remember her. Her husband was killed, poor thing, and she's rather on her own. Edward, it's all right. You don't have to say anything. I won't. Right. Well, thanks. And thanks for telling me. I'm sorry, Hugo, but it's toast and bovril for breakfast, too. It's a funny thing about bovril, isn't it? I mean, do you think it's made from the whole bowl? Or just that intensely reliable face you see on the jars? I say, you really are distractingly beautiful. No, toast is just fine. Although what I should really like would be a lobster. Life in Yorkshire with my dear mamma was one long wartime scone. And they were like small hand grenades. I can't tell you how glad I am that Michael has married you. I was afraid he would never marry anyone. Have you got a piano here? Uh, we could go and sing duets. It might cheer you up. You know things like, my true love has my heart and I have his. It's pure treacle if you ask me. I shouldn't think people get to ask you much. And <laughs> you know, I've always been a precocious only child. Should I go and view your baby? He's not here. He's in the country with my family. It's safer. Huh. Oh, well, I can't, then. Actually, I'm not mad on babies. They're nearly always damp, and they look so depressing. It amazes me they're so popular with people. They're not particularly popular with me. Really? That's most interesting. Poor you having one, then. 
And poor me, though. Why? I have to go to work. Uh, I thought you were in the army. Mm. Yeah, I am. A desk job at the moment, though. No, let's not talk about it. <laughs> let's see if we can't cheer ourselves up with a duet. Do you have time now? Mm. No. I'm... It'll have to wait until this evening. <laughs> Something to look forward to. You'll be able to meet Clary and Polly. They'll be back by then. Ah, something else to look forward to. <laughs> Cheerio for now. <laughs> oh, darling, thank goodness you're there. There's been a fire. So I've been told. How do you mean? Your sister-in-law rang home place this morning to inform them. She can't have. I assure you she did. Luckily, she got my sister-in-law and telephoned me straight away, rather than tell my wife. How could she have done such a thing? You must have given her the number. It would. Of course I haven't. She, she will have got it from directory inquiries. Well, you must have told her about the fire. Of course I did. I had to. The place is such a mess. I had to see if she would take the children while I try and sort it out. The sitting room's nearly a foot underwater from the fire brigade. Well, how did it happen, anyway? It was the chimney. Large crossbeam caught fire, or rather smouldered. I went upstairs because I thought I heard Susan and found the children's rooms full of smoke. It was incredibly lucky I went up when I did. Oh, Lord. Beastly bad luck. Where are you now? At the pub in the village. My telephone isn't working. Isla came over and took the children, thank goodness. I hope you told her to stop ringing out my home. Edward, I didn't get any sleep last night. I'm dead beat. The children might have died, and the house is in an indescribable mess. I really do think you might be a little more... Edward? He wouldn't have cut her off, surely, thought Diana. She waited a minute to see if he would ring back, and then realised, of course, that he couldn't because he didn't know the number. But somehow pride stopped her ringing him again. She was afraid, if she did, he would say things that would make her resent him more. I couldn't cope with that, she thought wearily, as she bicycled against the wind back to the cottage. I'm glad to have met him. It's good to see something of your family. Archie isn't actually family. He feels like it. Anyway, he's a good friend for you to have. For me to have... if what? Don't worry, honey. It won't be just yet. Why? Will you be going? Yes. To France? Yes. For how long? For as long as it takes. Don't worry, I'm just a reporter. Only a kind of witness. I shan't be fighting. But you might... Anything could happen. I went to Italy in January to take pictures of the landings. You never told me. No, but I came back safe and sound. It's my job. We should never have met if I hadn't had this job. You will tell me. Warn me before you go. Jack, will you please? No, I won't. Zoe, I can't. So, let's not talk about it. Girl, Diana, darling, what is it? Oh, Edward, when did you get here? Just now. You, you probably didn't hear the car for the planes. Here, let me help you up. Oh. Oh, oh. You've sprained your ankle. Oh. The hot water ran out. I was trying to finish scrubbing the floor and I slipped. Oh. Have you got any whiskey? Um, we finished it last time. Well, I brought some. It's in my briefcase. Here. Have my handkerchief. I'll get us a glass. Oh, my poor sweet, you have had a rough time with this. By the time I discovered the telephone number of the pub, you're gone. I, I don't know how we got cut off. So oh, I was a beast after all you've been through. No sleep, and I bet you've had no lunch. What you need when you've drunk that is a nice hot bath, and then I'll take you out to dinner. And I can't. I couldn't get into a bath. Anyway, there's no hot water left. Not a drop. Well, then, I'll, I'll put you in the car and take you to an hotel. Diana felt the resentment that had dissolved into pure relief at his appearance begin to crystallize. He seemed always to think that everything could be resolved by a few passing creature comforts. She wanted to say, and then what? 
but some innate caution stopped her. She decided upon a false rather than a wrong move. Oh, darling, that would be so lovely. You can't imagine. A few weeks after Hugo moved in, Louise was conscious of a light-hearted happiness that seemed entirely new to her. When he left to go to work at the war office each morning, the knowledge that he would return in the evening sustained her all day. I'm home. <laughs> For you. Oh. <laughs> I'll get a vase. Hugo, you are the kindest person I've ever met. You are the person I love the most that I've ever met. <laughs> Louise, I haven't asked you. I swore I never would, but here I am doing it. Do you love Michael? I thought I did. But I don't know. I feel as though all my feelings are wrong and I ought not to feel them. I try not to have any, but it gets worse and worse. The last time he came up, I couldn't bear him even. I... I sort of knew. From the first day I saw you. Well, anyway. You have me. I don't, though. Do I? Yes, Louise. Yes, you do. For a few nights, they met in the drawing room, lay together on the floor in front of the fire, locked in each other's arms, kissing until their mouths were sore and they were exhausted with longing. But it was by some unspoken mutual consent that they did not consummate their relationship. Jack, it's me. Are you there? Jack? Zoe had gone to his flat as arranged. But he wasn't there. She waited and waited. This must be it, she thought. The invasion must have begun. You look lovely, Paul. Doesn't she, Hugo? Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> well, where are you off to? Maidenhead, for a picnic with Archie. Is Clary going with you? No, just me. Polly didn't add that it had, in fact, been her idea, and she'd rung Archie to suggest it. Do you need to take some food, Paul? N not that there's much here. No, Archie said he'd bring it. How delightful. You both at the riverbank, looking like that painting by Gauguin. Or, or do I mean Manet? Neither, I should think. Certainly not warm enough to be the Manet. Why? Oh, is that the one which has no clothes on? <laughs> I'll see you both later. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I really like it when we have the house to ourselves. Mm. Yeah, Michael's due back today. Mm. Let's hope. It's later rather than sooner. Louise, I don't feel things can go on as they are. What do you mean? You think we should stop? No. I think I should speak to Michael. About what? Us. It's the only honourable thing to do. I, I can't see how that will make anything better. I've thought about it and thought about it. It's our only option. At first, Louise was aghast at the idea. <laughs> was sure that it could not lead to any good solution. But Hugo was unwavering. And gradually, although she felt very frightened at the prospect, she also felt that as long as Hugo was there, everything would be all right in the end. You want it home? You stay here. I'll go up to talk to him. Right. As Polly walked towards Paddington Station, she felt that for months now she had lived a secret double life. One with her family and the people she met and worked with, and one that contained only herself and Archie. The second life was hardly a life, since there was no continuity to it. It was more like playing selected pieces of film, again and again. It started with the recollection of real life events, like the first time Archie had invited her to have supper with him on her own, without Clary. I don't get enough of either of you when you're together. Quite soon, Polly dropped the either from her memory. I don't get enough of you. Then, when she told him about Mr. Fairburn, her boss at the interior design company where she worked, proposing to her. 
Well, Paul, you are <laughs> immensely pretty and attractive, so you must expect this kind of thing. Other people don't seem to have so much trouble. Well, other people aren't as pretty as you are. But she had fished for that compliment, so it hadn't been as good as the unsolicited ones were. After that, Polly dropped pure memories and started to make things up. What it would feel like if he put his arms around her, if he told her that he longed to see more of her. The fantasies gradually became bolder, but they were inhibited, as she discovered, by the increasing disparity between what she thought about him when he wasn't there and what actually happened when he was. Paul, over here. Oh, I didn't see you there. Oh, you're looking well. That's Clary. She's working. But it's Sunday. Well, you know what Noel's like. Uh, no, I don't, actually. He seems to ask her to work far too much, but she's besotted with him. Is she? Is she? I thought he was married. One can't necessarily choose who one's besotted with. Uh, I suppose not. And is Hugo still staying with you all? Yes. Having him in the house has really perked Louise up. Well, it has all of us, really. He's so funny. He's got a good eye, too. Help me out more than once with ideas for clients. How is your job going? Fine, I'll tell you when we're on the train. Uh, platform three. I think we can make it even with my leg. Shall I take that hamper? Uh, no, 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 I can manage. Thank you. Louise, would you join us, please? I've never heard such nonsense in all my life. You're both behaving like spoilt children. Although I would have thought that you, Hugo, at least, were old enough to know better. What on earth am I supposed to say to such an utterly idiotic proposition? It's pretty odd if one's away fighting this war, which perhaps you hadn't noticed is still on, and then one comes back to find one's cousin has been making trouble with one's wife. And quite extraordinary that she should apparently forget her position. For God's sake, stop talking about Louise as though she wasn't here. Actually, I'm simply going to stop talking about it altogether. It isn't worth talking about. I must go or I'll be late for lunch. What lunch? With Mummy, I thought I told you. No. Well, I don't feel like taking you now anyway, given the circumstances. Hugo, this is my house. And after what you've just told me, I shall expect you to leave at once. And don't ever consider coming back. Right, of course. I can't possibly stay. It would be thoroughly dishonourable. Can I come with you? No. Hugo! I've nowhere to live and I'm tied to the army. Michael was being horrible. We were honest with him. We told him the truth. There was any way you did. Well, the truth isn't always jolly for other people. He loves you too. Can't leave that out. How do you know he loves me? He wouldn't have been so furious if he hadn't. We shouldn't have told him then. No, oh, darling, we should. And anything else would just be lies and deceit. It's awful stuff. Well, you go. I haven't thought. I'll find somewhere. No, you mustn't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll ring you on Monday evening. After Michael has gone, I promise. Oh, Hugo! It's a hell of a mess, isn't it? Shall I come with you to the bus? Better not. I don't... I'd rather say goodbye to you here. I love you so much. You are the person that I love the most that I have ever met. <sighs> goodbye, dear, darling Louise. Polly and Archie found the perfect place for their picnic, a little grassy promontory with willows dripping down to the olive-coloured water. She was trying to remember the famous painters Hugo had mentioned so she could casually insert them into the conversation, but she couldn't seem to concentrate properly. I had another letter from Neville this week. He seems much happier. Paul? I'm sorry, Archie, I was miles away. This is just so idyllic. Mm. What were you saying? Mm. Only that now he's in his third term at Stone, Neville seems very settled. What's good of you to get him out of that other beastly school? 
They had no idea he was being bullied. It's not considered very masculine to admit these things. He loves you very much. He told Clary, in case you didn't know. Well, as I've said before, I've become a sort of stand-in for their father. Only Clary still believes he's still alive. Well, do you mean she's the only one who still believes Rupert's alive, or despite everything, she believes he's still alive? Both. I'm afraid I no longer believe it, nor do I think anyone else in the family does. Do you? No. Sadly, I don't think I do. What about you? What are you going to do with your life? I'm not sure. I get rather confused about that. Well, you shouldn't worry, my pretty Paul. Sir Wright will come along and sweep you off on a white horse. Will he? How do you know? Well, I don't absolutely know. You may not want to simply to get married. You may want to do something on your own. Well, I would quite like to get married. Aha! And have you chosen the lucky chap? Yes. It's you. Well, I've honestly thought a great deal about it. I'm completely serious. I know I'm quite a bit younger than you are, but, but people of different ages do get married, and I'm, I'm sure it works out all right. I'm only 20 years younger, and by the time I'm 40 and you're 60, it will be nothing at all. Nothing. I wouldn't consider marrying anyone else. And you know me quite well. And you've said you like my appearance. I've been practicing cooking, and I wouldn't mind where we lived, even if you wanted to go back to France. I wouldn't mind anything. Oh, Paul, what a compliment. I've never had such a great and serious compliment paid to me in my life. And I'm not going to hide behind all that tosh about me being too old for you, although in, in, in some ways it may be true. I love you very much. I regard you as a serious friend, but you are not my love. And the awful thing is that unless you were, the whole thing wouldn't stand a chance. And you don't think you ever could be? It's the kind of thing one knows, you know. Yes. Dear Paul, you have your whole life before you. That's what I was thinking. I suppose you think I shouldn't have told you. I don't think that at all. I think it was extremely brave of you. It hasn't made any difference, though, has it? Well, at least you wanted to know something, and you asked. And now I've moved from hope to despair, she thought. She did not know how to be without him for the rest of her life. And she did not know how to be with him now, miles from anywhere. But she was saved by a sudden rain shower. Quick, quick let's get this stuff back in the basket. Come on. There was nothing for it but to go back to the station and wait for a train. I trust he's gone. Yes. I'm taking command of a new destroyer on Monday and you are to join me at the port. I'm to stay on the boat with you. No, in an hotel, and I will sleep ashore with you. We'll leave tomorrow afternoon. T tomorrow? Yes. And I require only one undertaking from you. You are not to write or to communicate with Hugo in any way at all. Please, could I write just one letter to explain what's happening? No. My father will make it clear to him what's happening. You told your parents all about it? Yes. It's quite unnecessary for you to do anything about it at all. Where are you going now? Back to Hatton with them. I'll come and fetch you tomorrow afternoon. I don't want to stay here tonight. Archie, I haven't told anyone what I told you. Not even Clary. I wouldn't dream of telling Clary or anyone else. Thank you. Oh, dear. I bet I've caught a cold. Would you like to go for a drink when we get off? Um, I think I'll just go home. Will anyone be there? Oh, yes. Louise and Hugo. And Claire will probably be back by now. And Michael is coming home today. That should be jolly. Yes. 
In fact, she thought, they would probably all be out to dinner somewhere. But it turned out that she was wrong about that as well. As she let herself in, she could hear Louise upstairs, sobbing. Where's Hugo? Where's Michael? I don't know. I don't care. What's happened? Oh, Polly. How can I bear it? They'll all hate me for it. For what? Hugo. I loved him so much. With all my heart. And now I've got the whole of the rest of my life without him. <gasps> I don't know how to manage that at all. Oh, oh, oh. oh. you are so comforting to cry with me. You should eat something, Louise. This will soon be over. What will? The war. Then we can all be together like a proper family again. No, I rang home plate. Your mother says Sebastian has cut two more teeth, and the new nanny is a great success. She sent her love. Fine. What are you doing? Lying down. We've only just had breakfast. Sorry to call you at home, Zoe. Who is that to answer? My mother-in-law. She seemed very nice. Yes. Oh, Jack, it's lovely to hear your voice. How are you? How are things in France? My best friend in New York, he was a Polish Jew, told me that if I ever got to Paris, I must look up his parents who've been living there since 1938. And did you? Well, I, I went to the house where they used to live, and they weren't there. I asked around, and I discovered that they'd been taken off to a camp a few months before the invasion. Both of them? Yeah. They were collected one night, and nobody ever heard anything more. But if they went to a camp in Germany, you, you'll still be able to find them, won't you? I mean, we've nearly got to Berlin. I've already been. Any sign? No. I have to go back again. Maybe you'll find them this time. Is something wrong? I was wondering if you could get away for tonight. Oh, Jack, I just said I can look after the children so the nurse can have the weekend off. It, it wouldn't be for the weekend, just for tonight. I'd really like to see you. Oh, you make it so difficult. You know I want to come. I can't, though. I, I really can't. Okay, that's it then. Jack? Jack! What? Uh, that was Arthur downstairs in reception. He has to go to London for a meeting tomorrow. Uh, you know his wife's just had a baby. He's worried about leaving her on her own and would like it if you went and stayed. The last few weeks of living in the hotel with Michael seemed somehow to have turned Louise into a child living with a grown-up. He seemed in charge of her life, and she was too unhappy to question or resist. Would you like me to? Yes, I think you should. The poor chap is beside himself with worry. Baby was premature and she's had some kind of fever. They don't know what it is, but her mother will arrive sometime during the day, so it's only for one night. All right. I do love you, you know. Louise thought, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it to get away from you. But she didn't say anything. Jack, what on earth are you doing here? Just a quick visit. I hope you don't mind. Of course not. And this must be your little girl. Jules, this is Jack. Mm. I'm sorry she can be quite shy with people she doesn't know. I understand. Your mother-in-law has been very kind, giving me tea and scones. And now it seems very tactfully left us alone. Yes. Jules, darling... Why don't you find Aunt Rach and see if she'll give you a piece of cake? No, no. Go on. I'll come in a bit. I just need to talk to Jack first. Hello? It's Louise. Captain Hadley's wife. Miss 
Stanley? Arthur said he'd get my mum. She will be here tomorrow. I'm going to look after you for tonight. Where's the baby? Mafanwi pushed the bedclothes down, exposing a tiny baby tightly wrapped in a shawl that lay as silent and motionless as a doll beside her. And the awful notion that he was already dead occurred to her. He's very quiet. He won't take anything. He doesn't want anything. What's his name? Owen. Louise experienced a moment of absolute panic in which the baby, already being dead, and its mother insane with fever and grief, assailed her. He's going to die. I know it. Oh. No. No. I'm going to give you your medicine and you will have a good sleep. Louise looked at Mafanwi. Please, God, let me do the right thing, she said, over and over to herself. If I go to sleep, he will die. I will look after him and then he won't die. Louise edged around the bed and picked up the baby. He was far smaller than Sebastian had ever been, but he was not dead. His swollen, almost transparent eyelids flickered and then were still again. You won't sleep, though, will you? You'll watch him for me. Yes, I will. I'll stay awake if you promise to go to sleep. <laughs> Louise held the baby next to her skin and felt as if both their lives depended on her being able to keep him warm. Would you like more tea? No, thank you. I've ordered a cab. It'll be here soon. Oh. She looks very like you, Zoe, your daughter. So people say. How was the camp in Germany? I didn't want to say anything in front of Juliet. It was all in front of the children there. They were playing around a huge pit, 80 yards long, 30 feet wide, piled high with the bodies of their mothers, grandmothers, aunts, naked skeletons piled on top of each other. Oh, Jack. Do you like me to come back to London with you? I have to go back very early tomorrow morning. It, it wouldn't be worth it. Back to that camp? No. Another one, Buchenwald. Our troops are there. I... I've been once, but I've got to go back. But when you rang, when you called me from London, you, you wanted me to come then. I had a sudden urge to see you. Then I thought that I'd like to see you in your home with your family before I went. When will you be back? Your mother-in-law is one nice lady. You're in good hands. But thanks for offering to come. But those poor people will be all right now, won't they? I I mean, they're safe now, and people will look after them and give them food. Some of them. Six hundred are dying and being buried every day at Belsen. And they say over two thousand will die at Buchenwald. Too far gone. And those aren't the only camps, you know. We haven't reached all of them, but they'll all be like that. I'm... I'm just so sorry. It's too terrible for words. I think the cab will be here by now. I mustn't miss the train. I'm glad I've seen Juliet at last. I'll see you out. Jack, you're not angry with me, are you? What makes you think that? You haven't kissed me. You haven't touched me, even. I'm not angry with you. I've gotten rather out of touch with love. You'll have to bear with me about that. I will. I will, but it, it will come back, won't it? Sure. Will you say goodbye to everyone for me? And, and thanks for everything. Don't cry. I'm glad I came. Look after yourself and Jules. You call her that, don't you? As the night wore on, it became harder and harder for Louise not to fall asleep. <laughs> 
but she was determined. It was her growing conviction that the baby's life was a painfully fragile business, that he needed not only her warmth and nursing, but also her constant determination that he should live. That meant she didn't close her eyes for even a moment. Good morning, Mrs. Hadley. Oh, well, you look much better. <laughs> How is he? He's fine. Look. Oh, Owen. <laughs> Owen. <laughs> you go back to bed, and I'll bring you a cup of tea. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really am so so grateful to you. For your goodness. But it was Louise who was grateful, because if she hadn't felt she'd made a difference, she would have continued to feel completely worthless. Oh, darling, you're back. H how was my family? She was so much better for a good night's sleep, and the baby survived my attentions. You look shattered. I was too frightened to sleep in case he took a turn for the worse.、Oh, I'm sure you made all the difference. Oh, you're shivering. Here, put this around you. He put his dressing gown around her shoulders, and it warmed her, as did his confidence in her. Thank you. I'm sorry. I have to go now. But I'll be back for dinner. Alone, Louise began to shiver. She pulled the dressing gown around her, and thrust her hands in the pockets. There was a letter in one of them. Pulling it out, she recognised Z's handwriting. My dearest Michael, just received yours of the tenth, and thought you would like to know that Hugo has been sent to join his regiment in Germany, so that he is safely out of the way. I do hope, my darling, that this relieves you. As in spite of us exacting a promise from him that he would not communicate with Louise in any way, you must feel that neither of them is to be trusted. We were appalled to hear that he had written in spite of his promise. How lucky that you were able to intercept it! Of course, I think you were right to do so. The whole business must have been most distressing for you, as indeed it has been for me. Since any trouble of yours, my darling, becomes mine also. Love and blessings, Mummy. Louise read the sheet of paper twice, but the tumult of emotion it evoked was no less from a second reading. Anguish that Hugo had left the country and she had not known it, fear that he would be killed, relief that he had not obeyed the family injunction but had written to her nonetheless, an agony of impatience to find and read the letter he had sent, and through all this, rage. She began to search for the letter. Oh, I forgot my raincoat. Louise, what's happened? I've read this. You shouldn't have done that. Why not? Z reads other people's letters. I want my letter from Hugo. That's not possible. I've destroyed it. After reading it, I suppose. No, that would have been dishonourable. <laughs> I simply destroyed it. It was a promise, after all. I was made to promise not to write. I did not promise not to receive a letter. It was only one letter. It would have been something to keep some comfort where otherwise there is none. It's much better to make a complete break. You will get over it sooner that way. How do you know I want to get over it? I loved Hugo. In all these weeks, it does not seem to have occurred to you that I love him. And how do you think that makes me feel? You loved me enough to marry me and have my child. <gasps> these weeks have not been easy for me either. I've tried to make allowances. I know you're very young.、And、marriage is difficult when one partner has to be away so much of the time. You will get over Hugo, but it will happen far sooner if you will just make some effort. Have you really destroyed my letter? For God's sake, yes.、I'm、not a liar, surely you know that. You are not a liar, but you do not tell the truth. She looked at him as though she had never seen him before. I shall never forgive you for destroying my letter. The row. Like all the worst rows, did not end there, or indeed at any particular moment thereafter. Louise slept for the rest of the day, and when he rejoined her much later in the evening, she pretended to be asleep.
thought she said you might be in here. Oh, hello, Archie. What is it? Zoe, I'm sorry. Is it Rupert? No. It's Jack. Jack? How, how do you know that? He sent me a letter. He... He died. He sent you a letter to say he was dead? He said to tell you that he loved you and to thank you for it. Can I see it? Yes, yes. Uh, here, here. Perhaps I should fix us both a drink. Dear Archie, Sorry to bother you with this, but I couldn't think of who else to ask. I've made several efforts to write to Zoe, but I couldn't find any way of telling her. Anyway, by the time you get this, I'll be dead. I have two days' work to do here, then I shall put the film with this letter on, on a plane and put a bullet through my head. She'll ask you why. Tell her I couldn't live with what I've witnessed. These are, were, my people. I couldn't make her happy, not after the days here at Buchenwald and Belsen. Tell her I loved her, and thank her for that. Oh, hell. Tell her whatever you think best. I know you'll see her through it. Jack Greenfelt. I know this is the most awful shock, but I felt I should tell you the truth. Thank you. The funny thing is, I sort of knew. Not that this would happen, but... But that it was an end, somehow. He turned up here, without any warning. And we sat in this room. And then he went. And I had the thought I would never see him again. Poor Jack. <laughs> I expect you think it was very bad of me to go off like that, to have an affair. No, I don't. I think it's very understandable. Understandable, but not good. But I don't believe Rupert is going to come back. If that was going to happen, it, it would have happened by now. I think Jack came here to make sure I would be all right. That showed love. Yeah, yes, it did, didn't it? Mug, thank you. You've been to sea before, all right. What makes you say that? Wouldn't only use one match else. Rupert had refused the offer of a bunk in one of the two cramped little cabins below. It had been dark when they left Guernsey. Just as well, since he had no papers of any kind, and it had been easy to slip aboard with the seaman who had befriended him. Sorry I'm so late, Clary. I had to break some bad news. About Hugo. Hugo? Michael's cousin who stayed with us. He was killed last week. We've all been so upset, but Louise has taken it the hardest. I'm so sorry, I didn't know. At the very end of the war. It somehow makes it even more unfair. Yes, yes it does. It wasn't about Dad, was it? Of course not, Clary. If I'd heard anything about him, you'd be the first person I'd tell. It was nobody you knew. It's so lovely to see you. Sorry. My hair's wet. I thought you ought to wash it for the piece, and there wasn't time to get it dry. Well, you look very nice. Attractive. Do I? Yeah. I don't look anything like Polly, though. She's gone to the Reform Club with Uncle Hugh to celebrate victory. I can't see why we can't all be together, but... 
Paul didn't want to. Well, you'll just have to make do with me. It won't be making do. You're not a making do sort of person, Archie. More a people's first choice. Very kind, I'm sure. Did you go to work today? You bet. Noel doesn't consider that it's a particular day at all. You could do better than work for him. It might be small, but it's a very good publishing company. Why don't you write a novel? Me. Well, what else are you writing? Nothing. What about your journal? It was tried and superficial, so I stopped. Who told you that, Noel? It doesn't matter. What do you think of socialism? Oh, you prefer to change the subject. Yes. Well, I think it's on the cards. War is quite a leveler. When practically everybody's life has been on the line, people are unlikely to take kindly to reverting to a class system where some people's lives matter more than others. Do you think that now women will get taken more seriously then? I've no idea. Aren't they taken seriously? Cleary looked across the table at him. He sat surveying her with his usual expression of suppressed amusement. But besides that, she was conscious of a kind of intelligent looking, as though he was really seeing her without criticism or sentiment. Just get your head down for a bit. I'll bring you a mug of tea in the morning. I haven't drunk tea for about five years. You got a tree coming up. Returning, although it had all the trappings of a happy ending, would mean the reunion with a number of people he loved, some of whom must have become strangers. Zoe, how would she be? He must not expect too much. Then he remembered. That was what he always said to himself about her. Better come back with me, Clary. I live nearer than you, and we'll, we'll never get a cab. It was worth it, wasn't it? Waiting. We got to see the king and queen twice, and I've only ever seen them before on newsreels. Come on then. <laughs> Polly told me. Ah. It only came up because I couldn't understand why we couldn't all spend this evening together. Poor Paul. You can know something is completely ridiculous, but if you see it isn't to the other person, it almost seems not to be. Is that how it struck you? Well, not that somebody shouldn't be in love with you, but they ought to be more your age, oughtn't they? I suppose I seem incredibly ancient. No, not incredibly at all. In fact, you don't seem to have aged at all since I met you. Thanks for that. Sorry. What for? I don't know how, but I seem to have hurt your feelings. I'm really sorry about Paul. I I'm very fond of her, you know. She knows, but she says it's the wrong kind of fond. I can see that burning antagonism might be a better start. You have. Have what? Aged since I met you. Oh. I see what you were minding. Me implying you were old. All I meant was that you were far too old for Polly. Perhaps we'd better resume our hobble home. <laughs> Perhaps we had. Would his parents still be alive? Thought Rupert. Could he bear to go back to the timber business? To giving up the idea of painting for the second time in his life, Michel had found him some materials to draw with. He would have gone mad during those first years, when she had constantly to hide him, and he could not go out or speak to anyone if he had not been able to draw. Zoe would still be beautiful; he was sure of that. But he had learned with Michel to discover beauty in other aspects. I hope you don't mind me wearing your pajama jacket, and I use some of your toothpaste in my finger. I don't mind at all. Here's your cocoa. When I was quite young, well, about thirteen, Neville had an asthma attack and I couldn't sleep. So Dad came in with a mug of hot milk, and I didn't want to drink it because of the skin, and he picked it off and ate it for me. That showed love, didn't it? <laughs> uh, yuck! There, you're still loved. <laughs> Copycat. 
There is something... Something about Dad that I wanted to talk to you about. Well, dis discuss, you know. Right. Shove up. After the invasion last year, I thought, you see, that he would be bound to come back. I mean, there would be no Germans to stop him. And then, when he didn't, I thought he probably got some sort of war job, which meant he had to stay in France until the peace. And now we've got that. So what I thought was, it might be best if I made a sort of date, and if he hasn't come back by then, I will have to understand that he never will. I thought this would be an easy date for both of us to remember. A year from now. Good idea. It's odd. I used to mind about him so awfully because of me. Because I missed him so much. But it seems to have turned into something different. I do miss him, of course, but... I mind it more for him. Because I wanted him to have a good life and all of it. Not be cut off. It isn't that I don't still love him. I know, I know it isn't. Now, I think what's happened is that you've grown up and your love has grown up with you. Good night, darling Archie. After all, I've always got you. Good night. That and her earlier comment about his being a first-choice sort of person had given him inordinate pleasure. Lying in the dark alone on the sofa, Archie made a pact with himself. If Rupert did not return, he would pledge himself to taking his place as much as was possible. If Rupert came back, however, he might embark upon a very different course. Here. Yeah. Get this down. It's cocoa made with hot milk. Sorry, tea's run out. Thank you. I never met anyone before who liked the skin. I don't. Why'd you eat it? I don't know. I felt I should. It's the war. Turned everything on its head. At least we're still here and in one piece. We should be celebrating. Yes. But Rupert's heart felt as cold as ash from a fire deliberately put out, and rekindling it seemed insurmountable. If one knew anything about love, he supposed it should be possible. Somehow, he thought, somehow, I must find it in me to make a start. <laughs> <laughs> 